Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Last week, I told you that the book, The Man Who Hated Work and Loved Labor, The Life and Times of Tony Mazzocchi, was a riveting biography. So I'm glad to say that this week, Les Leopold joins us once again to further talk about this outstanding person. Thank you. Thank you. So we me. left it, I think, when Tony was the, still the legislative director of the Oil Chemical Atomic Workers Union based in Washington, right? Correct. He was working out of the... Uh, and he was out there energizing the public and making all these bridges between different groups and advocates to further um, improve working conditions for working people. One of the most famous ones was the Kermagee plant and the pollution. Tell, let's, tell us about that. It's very interesting. Uh, just a little background in that uh, Mizaki had created these health and safety struggles at 20, 30, 40 different companies around the country, the biggest companies you can imagine. He had just... Uh, and those are the ones he sent the doctors the, the, and different sent, scientists. Yes, right, and sent people. doctors. And, 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 and there was a big strike in, uh, uh, in uh, 1973, uh, 74, uh, the Shell strike. And it was uh, called... Shell oil. Shell oil. And it was, called, it was over health and safety conditions. And it was called America's first environmental strike. And he, and he basically had won that strike. And he... he and he felt very confident that he knew how to deal with corporate America, that if he embarrassed them enough, especially if he could embarrass them in the major newspapers in the country, and he had very good skills at doing that, he could bring them to their knees, and they would improve conditions. Uh, something different happened, though. He ran into a different kind of industry in, uh, uh, in 1974. Uh, matter of fact, I was an intern there at the time, and I was walking out the door, in came in this little trio from a tiny plant in Oklahoma, Cimarron, Oklahoma. It was a Kerr McGee facility, had 150, 200 workers. And what did they make? They made plutonium rods oh. for the fast breeder nuclear reactor, a new technology that was so amazing, it created more plutonium when it was done than it used at the beginning, because mm. it turned some uranium into plutonium. And it was supposed to be this you know, it would make energy so cheap you didn't have to meter it. And it also made a lot of nuclear f fuel. But there were many bets placed on this industry. And I don't think Tony realized at the time that this industry played a different game. This was than, than the oil industry. This, this, was, this industry was tied into both the uh, budding uh, atomic uh, power industry and the national security state for weapons. Was this part of the military industrial complex? Well, I think Kerm well, Kerr McGee was the largest producer of uh, uh, a miner of uranium in the country. So they were definitely involved in that. And they, they saw their chance to get into this fast breeder reactor business. Uh, the problem was, uh, well, from their point of view, they didn't want a union there. So they were trying to eliminate uh, the union. They were uh, 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 trying to, uh, at that point, they, they a few years before, they had had a strike, and they, uh, uh, it was a right-to-work state, so they could, you didn't have to join the union. There were only 20 members of the union left out of, you know, 150. And this was OCAW. Uh, Oil Chemical and mm -hmm. Atomic Workers Union. And so it was a very weak union. They wanted to get rid of it entirely. And these people were coming into Tony's office asking for help. Uh, two men, and the third wheel was this young, skinny little gal called, named Karen Silkwood. And Tony heard their complaints, and it was just, <laughs> it was a, a disaster there. Uh, they had no idea that plutonium was the most deadly substance ever found. They didn't know there was any connection with cancer. They had no I, uh, uh, idea that when these alarms went off and, and, and they found readings in their noses meant that the stuff was in their lungs. They had no idea about anything. The turnover rate in the plant was so bad, 60% of the workers left every year. So you're making a nuclear product with a workforce that's turning over virtually every day people are leaving. So Tony heard this and he just... Did Tony know the danger of plutonium? Oh, God, yeah. <coughs> yeah. No, he, he was well aware. But he thought this was an absolute loser. That there was nothing... He said, okay, I'll have my assistant work with you, a guy named Steve Watt, a very young, young man, 25 at the time, I think, work with you to prepare testimony for the Atomic Energy Commission. I listened to the tapes of his working with them and it's just, you know... Uh, it's just like it was just a hellhole, uh, and t Tony said, "No way is this gonna 
uh, work out. Problems. No, there's just no way we're going to win this. It's a loser. Matter of fact, the atomic people in the union never let Tony get near an atomic plant because they were totally tied into the national security state, and he was considered kind of a radical. And so uh, this is all inter union inter, politics. inter stuff. So the fact that they even sent these people to his office meant that it was Intra. a loser. Right. Right. So it was just <laughs> so. Tony goes into his office, and when the gang was about to go out for dinner, Karen Silkwood slips into his office and says, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I haven't told anybody else, but I think they're cheating on their quality control tests. Tony goes, what did you say? And she explains that they take x-rays of the welds on these plutonium rods, and uh, when there were cracks in the welds, and they take the x-ray and take a black magic marker and just cover in the white crack. Uh, and pass it. And, and Tony says, do you have documentation of that? And she says, yes, and I've got some computer records also that we've been doctoring. Now Tony's eyes light up because he realizes that, that nobody cares if these workers are going to die in the long run because they're just, you know, that's the black box of the workplace and people, that's not a story. The real story was if this control rod failed in the fast breeder reactor, you got a problem because plutonium is so dangerous, the Atomic Energy Commission had studies already that showed that if uh, there was a plant they were thinking of building near Detroit, if it failed, if it had a meltdown, an area the size of Pennsylvania would be contaminated, seriously contaminated with hundreds of thousands of deaths. So uh, this was a big deal. Tony's friend, Dan Burnham, on the New York Times, had uh, the guy who broke the Serpico police corruption mm -hmm. case Tony thought was the perfect person for this story. So he told Karen Silkwood, look, don't tell anybody. I want you only to report to my assistant. Go back to the plant, get the evidence, and I will hook you up with uh, uh, David Burnham, and we'll have a huge story in the Times. In the meantime, I will bring some scientists in to educate people in the plant. That'll, that'll allow us to maybe win the decertification election. But then the Burnham thing will allow us to win a contract, because what's going to happen is going to be just like the oil industry. If they see all this negative press, the industry in general will jump on Kerr-McGee and say, settle this contract. That was the game plan. Was Karen a worker there? Karen a worker. In the, she was a, uh, uh, had some college. She was a, in the quality control lab. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't a production worker. Mm -hmm. She was a you know, mm -hmm. little higher position. Uh, and, uh, and, and she was, I listened to these tapes. She was a sharp cookie. First thing that happened, by the way, this whole thing I'm going to describe now happens quickly. So this is the end of September when they come into the office. She goes back to the plant, uh, and she reports to Steve Watka, and they tape these conversations yes. with her Tony's assistant. assistant, right? They tape these conversations on the phone, and they bring in these uh, uh, scientists who talk to the workers. And I got ta I had listened to the tapes of that too, and it was remarkable because the workers had no clue, and they start saying all of a sudden you can hear in the middle of these uh, lecture from these scientists from the University of Minnesota, they start realizing they've been poisoned. And uh, they start asking about, well, the company says uh, when they clean out our noses that we're okay when the readings go down. Is that true? And the docs say, well, no, it means it's not true. It got to your lung. They give us these vitamins, these chelated compounds. Will that get it out of our system? And they say, well, not really. And, they, they're, starting, and they're hearing a lot of bad news. So is Karen Silkwood. And she has this aha moment where she realized she's been poisoned as well because she's in the plant like everybody else and the alarms have been going off and she's, you know, she's been contaminated mildly like everybody else and she's starting to worry. Well, needless to say, the word gets out and they win the decertification election. <clears throat> and now the next step has to happen. She's got to take the materials that she has and she Claim she has them, and she's going to what, bring them to burn them. What's the de what was the oh, decertification? I'm sorry. Decertification and getting rid of the union. Uh -huh. There's an election to get rid of the union. Oh, the union wins. Wins. Uh, before Tony right. got involved, there was no chance that the union was mm -hmm. going to win. But when they saw their health was so imperiled, they figured right. we, we should listen we to the, the union. union. We need we need a union in here. But now they have to get the contract. The company could just mm -hmm. go force them out on strike, replace them with more farm workers mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, farm boys from and girls from uh, Oklahoma, right. and they'll and they'll it. lose again. Which was always the danger. Always the danger. And that's what happened two years earlier. Yeah. So Tony arranges that, uh, uh, the, you know, they're moving towards this meeting with Burnham. And uh, she claims she's got everything uh, all together. And she's talking to Steve Weick on the phone about it. And the next day she goes in the plant and all the alarms are going off. 
she's hot herself, hotter than she's ever been before. And they, you know, they clean her out, scrub her down, and they, they're trying to figure out how, how she got contaminated. Uh, she goes home, she comes back in, and Over again. worse. Now it's worse. It's a thousand times worse than before. And this is where, if you've seen the movie Silkwood, this is where they really scrub her down, it's all painful. But now they feel justified in trying to find the source. So they go into her house. Who they is they? They, meaning the company, and security service of the uh -huh. company, goes into the house, rips it all apart. Uh, uh, later on, people testify that they were reading her diaries and everything else. They're looking supposedly for the source, and we think they were looking for, for, the, the, for the documents. They weren't there. She had them someplace else. They don't, they don't say, oh, we'll find you, put you in a motel while we're ripping your house apart. No, they put her in a car and grill her with lawyers, because now they suspect her of smuggling plutonium out of the plant. How do you, I mean, think about that. How do you get out of the plant with plutonium? when you have the alarms there. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And why um, would you do that? Why would you do that? Well, that comes up later. They say they, she did it to kind of uh, uh, promote the union. She's very scared now. She, she, uh, she had kids when she was younger. She wants to get married and have kids again. She feels like she's not going to be able to. She's very upset. Tony, and, uh, t Tony intervenes. Watka tells her not to talk to any uh, lawyers anymore, only if he's there. They send her to New Mexico to get a whole, like a, almost like an MRI, a whole body scan to see how bad off she is. They say, well, it's not that bad, although their scale was based on a 200-pound man instead of a 90-pound asthmatic smoker. Uh, so you know, she probably was right. seriously exposed. She comes back. Uh, Tony moves up the meeting with uh, Burnham uh, in, in Oklahoma City. And she comes back, goes to a union meeting, and she confides to her friend at the end of the union meeting, she's crying, she's afraid she's, got, she's gonna die, that she's been exposed, and, but she felt very proud. She holds the papers and says, I've got the goods on them. And she tells her friend, she wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but she right. tells her friend, I'm going right now to meet with the New York Times. She hops in her car, and she was a very good driver, by the way. She was, uh, her, her boyfriend had taught her uh, to do race car driving and stuff. She has this little Honda, you know, early 70s right. Hondas were really little. She, dri she drives to uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, at the other end, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting. She doesn't arrive. Two hours late, they figure, oh, something must have happened, and you know, the meeting must be still going on. They call around. They find out there's been a terrible accident, and she's dead on arrival at the hospital. Berna, who's a police reporter, says, hey, this coincidence doesn't pass the sniff test. Let's go out and see where the accident took place. They go there. There are no papers. There's no nothing. The car has been towed away. They get the car. Uh, they have to tell the parents. And the parents release the car to them. That was very difficult. Uh, and Burnham says, you've got to get a crash investigator to look at this car. They hire a guy uh, uh, through some lawyers and friends. The union kicks in the money. This all happens very quickly. Uh, who had investigated 2,000 cases uh, before. And uh, they bring him, he investigates uh, the car. He has some crash cases. Crash cases. This is what he does for a living. <laughs> A.O. Pipkin was his name. Uh, meanwhile, so he comes in and looks at the car. Meanwhile, they're trying to get the police to do an investigation and, and the poli uh, to look for foul play. And what the police do is start building a case that she's a druggie that fell asleep at the wheel. And they found a joint in her glove compartment, uh, some quaaludes. You know, uh, she was on a tranquilizer, it's true. Uh, the, the thing that they could not explain was why the wheel was pushed back like this. She was wide awake. She was impaled on the wheel. She had hit this uh, culvert. And the crash investigators said that she was pushed from behind. There was a dent in the car that, could, that had nothing to do with the, the towing or anything yeah. else. And that, uh, she was whole, that she was probably run off the road and then pinned on the side of the road and then ran into this uh, culvert. And that the crash investigator said, foul play. Now it got interesting. How would the company respond to this information? Well, modern day management theory would say, oh, you put out a reward, you, you know, try to say nice things about your valued employee, you try to do all these things to make your image look good. Not in Oklahoma, not with Kerr McGee. They ran that state. Here's what they did. They start a rumor that says she smuggled the plutonium out in her vagina so that she, and poisoned herself, so that she could make the case for the union. They later found that somebody had put plutonium 
in a bologna sandwich. And every piece of plutonium has a slightly different radioactive signature. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that she had any access to ever in the plant was not the stuff. Connection. Somebody it was a different batch that ended up in her house. They gave everybody in the company lie detector tests. They asked people if they had affairs with each other. If you said yes, they fired you. If you lied and it showed up in the lie detector test, they fired you. They shut down the plant over Christmas, no pay. Just to, show, just to lock it down. The other two people that uh, went with her to visit the union, they ran out of the plant. And then the publicity was so bad in the area, the people started to turn on Karen Silkwood. They found out she was doing the secretive work for the union. Uh, people started referring to her as that bitch and, and who was threatening their jobs, and things looked really bad. So this is end of September. She dies in early November. We're now after Christmas, January. And, and Mizaki's desperately trying, and, and Burnham, trying to get stories in the Times, but they can't find a smoking gun. They can't find any of the papers. They're gone. They've disappeared. They can't find anything. Oh, also, the company started to investigate the investigator. Mm. They tried to yeah, undercut yeah. him, right, as well. And they brought in the Pinkerton Detective Agency to go after the investigator. Nice, and these are nice people. Uh, and now here's where it gets very spooky. Uh, Mizaki's at a health and safety con The union's telling Mizaki that he, we spent enough time, enough money, the other atomic workers are getting nervous, you should cool it. You don't have anything, you know, drop the case. Mizaki goes to a health and safety conference in War uh, Warrington, Virginia, at the Early, Early House. He's driving back, and next thing he remembers, his, his car, he's in a stretcher, the car had flipped over several times, he landed in the median, upside down, the whole roof of the car was smashed down to the steering wheel and he was out. And he doesn't remember any of it. He doesn't remember leaving the road, he doesn't remember flipping, nothing. He survived miraculously because this happened to be a car from the Ralph Nader days. It wouldn't start unless you had a seatbelt on. He survives. But he's, he's, he's very worried now because he, he thinks he was set up, that somebody right. gave him something. He can't believe that this yeah. happened. Another coincidence. Had he died, the whole thing would have been over. Nobody would have ever heard about Karen Silkwood. Then somebody named Ronnie Eldridge. Oh, come on. <laughs> right. Assigned a, rep a, a, a reporter to go and to write something about this. And a, a, couple of, a, a good story appeared in Miz. Another story appeared in Rolling Stone. NPR did some stuff. And Tony did exactly, he did what every good trade unionist does when their leaders tell them to shut up. He went around and talked to everybody. <laughs> and he, and a couple of uh, women from now. Uh, she became a big feminist symbol. Right. And uh, a movie happened, et cetera, et cetera. And now, do you think the CIA was involved in it? Do they think the CIA? Did he think the CIA well, was involved in it? Uh, I don't know if it was the CIA. The C when we the, asked the, the CIA for a FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information yeah. Act, they said they will neither confirm nor deny that they have any information on Tony Mazaki. And then when we appealed it, they said the same thing. Uh, but oh, so you never got it? You never got a, a confirmation, no. Uh, it, it's interesting. The, uh, in 1977, about a year and a half later, when he became vice president, they had to move from Washington to Denver, where the union's headquarters were. And he's taking a clock off his kitchen wall. Oh, that's right. And uh, something falls to the floor, and his wife goes, looks at it and goes, it's a bug. And Mazaki figures, oh, my God, it, another cockroach. And he takes off his shoe. He's ready to hit it. And his wife says, no, no, it's a listening device. I don't know why she thought it was, but it was a little metallic thing, kind of broken open and a little... Yeah. Uh, and it was. And it was. He, he gave it to uh, someone who actually had a CIA connection, and the guy put it back together again and said, what are you doing that's so interesting to the National Security Agency? So, so, there's an, so it, it, the union itself, so he was looking to improve working conditions. The atomic workers were concerned about their own health, but they were also concerned about their jobs. So as he would make more of a fuss, then the union would worry about losing it, or what, would they? Well, actually, there was a, a, a huge battle was brewing between kind of the national security state side, Cold War side of the union, and this more progressive, uh, uh, we want to lead the environmental yeah. movement and, 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 and build a new workers' movement. And the union, at the rank and file, was about, I'd say, 75-25 on Mazaki's side. But the leadership, because all the elections took place through a delegate system, mm -hmm. was almost evenly split. And I, I believe, personally, that the national security state CIA forces and their handlers really in those agencies didn't want to lose this union. The yeah. last person on earth 
that they wanted president of the union was Tony Mazzocchi. So they, yeah. they did everything they could to We don't have him. much time left oh again. Oh, my God. So, so when he ran, finally, he lost. He lost by this narrow vo vote, and uh, oh, all it kinds was, of things happened in, the, in, in yeah. the election. But he wasn't disillusioned. Never. <laughs> Never. So then he went on. But in the meantime, he created, the, 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 or he was partly responsible for the Labor Institute. Labor Institute. Which and also, you now head. Yes. And, and also, in which you interned. You were a... I, it started out of an internship with him, and then he later came and worked work with us. And then we started another institute called the Public Health Institute. And then he also started a, a whole new political apparatus. In his campaigns, he raised the idea of it was time for workers to have an independent political party. And he spent the last 20 years of his life really working on that, as well as single-payer health care. So he wanted like a labor party that stood for issues and fought the attempts to uh, get into electoral politics. At first. See, yeah. he, he didn't believe in rinky-dink spoiler politics. He knew a Labor Party couldn't elect, you know, right. a dog catcher. Right. Nothing. So he wanted to build a party over a long period of time that changed the dialogue in the country so that things were discussed that wouldn't be discussed between the two major mm -hmm. parties. Now, he saw that 9-11 and the advent of Bush was going to dramatically change uh, Mm -hmm. uh, slow down his timetable, but he was a very patient man. He was he he wanted a hundred thousand active members before they engaged in electoral activities. He wanted to be an education. He so believed in education. He wanted to be an educational forum to give uh, help workers develop a sense of themselves again and not kind of give up and be negative, fatalistic. And as he always would say, he was worried about things getting ugly that people would attack immigrants and start doing that kind of stuff because if the economy falls. He would say, I mean, he wouldn't, the economy somehow falls apart and people, unemployment rises, people might look for scapegoats, and he hoped to have a more positive vision. He, by the time he was working with you at the Labor Institute, the Public Health Institute, he had left the union. He left the union, and then seven years later, he got back in <laughs> as the number two guy, as secretary treasurer, uh, which almost never happens All in the All these different movement. alliances and politics. Well, very the union got, political. as he predicted, the union Eventually. got a lot smaller, yeah. and uh, he formed an alliance with... Uh, a guy who actually became more and more progressive as time went on, and they actually did wonderful things. But, at, to, but eventually was really responsible for the demise, right? Yes. I mean, they that's, merged. That's, that's, that's right. another tragic story. Yeah. Uh, there, there's so many twists there's and turns There's so much to learn in the book about union politics also, which is so very interesting. So do we have anybody like him now? Uh, we have... Uh, well, we, ha we have some people who are... I think cut from a, a similar cookie cutter. There's Eddie Ott, who's the head yes. of the uh, Central Labor Body yeah. in New York, who's a uh, uh, you know Great. wonderful and, yeah. and who knew Tony very well and kind of apprenticed with him. I think right. a little bit. Uh, you know, there, there's some very I think uh, uh, good labor leaders like uh, Leo Girard of the Steelworkers. I think is also a, uh, you know a, a great guy. I, I've yet to meet somebody that thinks as far. I mean, Mizaki was exceptional. He thought so far out of the box. Uh, was such a continual positive influence uh, uh, that, you know, it, that's a hard act to follow. With, with NAFTA, they tried to go out, didn't they, to organize advocacy groups against it? Did yeah. they? Uh, yeah. Would, no, he no, had been around, would that have been? Well, he was around for that. He was around Yeah, there actually NAFTA. was a very good labor environmental alliance yeah. over NAFTA. And he it was very close. That. Oh, yeah, he was involved yeah. in that, too. He was involved in the whole health care struggle. Uh, you know, you know I, I don't think he could have single-handedly bucked the, I mean, this has been a disaster for labor. He came, when he came into the labor movement, one out of three workers in the private sector was in a union. Imagine a place like New York. Virtually every family had a union member, almost every family. Brooklyn might have been 80, 90 percent. Now it's 7 percent in the private sector. I just saw a poll of Minnesota, Ohio, and uh, Wisconsin, and 78 percent of those people, the poll said, have nobody in mm. their family involved in any union, public or private. That's a, it's been quite a collapse. But, you know, n that didn't deter him because he says, you know, history's it's just when you, th when you th think it's, th it's all it's over, it's going to change. Workers start to, you know, get their act together and start doing right. stuff. So he was... He, he never thought there was any reason to, to, to quit on working people and that uh, they'll find a way. Should we uh, play a little bit of him saying that? So, brothers and sisters, I ask that you join in this debate, and I ask that you remember that you will have played 
a very distinctive part in the history of this nation because someone will look back someday and say, where did this movement originate? Uh, who fired that first shot? Rarely in our lifetimes do we get a chance to participate in a historical experience that reshapes the nation. That's what this proposal is all about. There's no insurance it's going to be successful. However, for our movement, that timepiece of destiny is ticking. And we are past the midnight of despair. And for our movement, I see a thunderous dawn approaching. And it's exclaiming, this is the moment, this is the moment, this is our moment. Thank you. I think people should read this book because they will be um, encouraged and inspired to go out and really try to change the world. Well, that would, that would be a great tribute to his spirit, that's yeah. for sure. Thank and you. You don't have to be a labor person to right. do that. Right. No, that's what it was. It was everybody. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.